that leads me, of course, to introducing our speaker for today, which is uh, Andrea Bossato. He's a professor at uh, University of Newcastle in uh, Australia, and he's an expert in karst hydrology, uh, or continental carbonates, and paleoclimates. He uses a whole host of approaches, including stable isotopes, uh, trace elements, uh, the fabrics of the carbonates, uh, radiogenic isotopes and high resolution imaging, um, including uh, micro XR, uh, XRF. And he has, of course, a lot of experience as well with trace and element analysis and is kind of at the cutting edge of method development for that kind of work. Um, so we are incredibly lucky and grateful um, for, uh, to Andrea for agreeing to summarize a lot of the what's currently happening in the field uh, and get us up to speed. Uh, to continue our work in CISOL as well. In this second part, uh, we will dig uh, in some more technical uh, uh, information about the partition coefficient and the incorporation in, uh, in this pilotem uh, calcite. And uh, then I will present some example of climate and environmental significance. Of course, uh, uh, up to today, there are more than 100 papers dealing with spilletum or drip water trace element. And uh, for this reason, it's, uh, it's virtually impossible to make a, a comprehensive review. So of course, I will concentrate on uh, the cases I studied and the most important cases that are, let's say, the, the reference uh, uh, for our study. And so in this first part, I will uh, talk about uh, what happened to the fluid phases when entering the aquifer and the cave. And then about the partition coefficient and incorporation in, uh, in spilotems. And I will finish with uh, some environmental and climate significant examples. So we all know what happened in the, uh, in the aquifer, but uh, it's just important to summarize what happened to the saturation state as the, the water uh, undersaturated in the epicast, where most of the carbonate dissolution takes place, finally enter in the bedrock in our aquifer when, where at some stage it reaches the, uh, the calcite saturation. And from this moment on, we can have uh, uh, precipitation of carbonate, usually um, calcite, but also aragonite sometimes. But most of the precipitation uh, occurs in the cave as the water reach the atmosphere of the cave and where most of the, the gassing uh, takes place. So prior calcite precipitation can occur also in the soil in very dry climate environment, in the aquifer, but as I said, mostly on the cave roof before hitting our stalagmite. On the other end, the dissolution is a more complex uh, process because we can have uh, both congruent dissolution or incongruent carbonate dissolution. And this is what happens usually. So if uh, we have a seasonal infiltration, we will we will be in a transient hydrological phase. This means that the, the composition, the trace element composition versus calcium ratio uh, uh, is different with respect to the host stroke. Only when we are in a steady state, so a continuous flux through the aquifer, we can reach uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the composition of the, of the host stroke. And also, the kinetic of the solution depends by the mineral present in the reaction. So aragonite is typically more soluble and it dissolves quickly with respect to calcite. And dolomite is the one that dissolves most uh, more slowly with respect to the other. So if we have a mixed mineral in our uh, bedrock, they will get uh, a different signature depending by the resident time of the water in the aquifer. So for our uh, uh, spilotem studies, we are uh, 
uh, using partition coefficients that are, let's say, uh, calculated for our cave environment. So the partition is the ratio between one element to calcium in the carbonate phase with respect to the uh, uh, ratio in the aqueous phases. And there are a number of studies that analyze this partitioning in uh, laboratory condition under, let's say, cave analog uh, condition, but also uh, in cave study, but using farmed calcite and uh, actual spilotens. And there are a couple of uh, lists of uh, uh, partition coefficient for the most common utilized elements like strontium, barium, magnesium. And uh, here on the right, we have a, a summary of, uh, of some of them. And we can see that apart from cadmium and some uh, transition metal that has a higher than one uh, partition, all the other elements, all the uh, uh, solute element, strontium, barium, uranium, magnesium, and so on, they have a much lower than one uh, partition, meaning that ju just a fraction of the dissolved uh, element will be incorporated in the calcite. And we can also see that there is a spread of value that can be quite substantial. Uh, and as we move down the list, some of the elements like uh, sulfur and sodium are very little incorporated. Less than 1% of the solute is incorporated in the, in the spilotem calcite. And uh, uh, this solution uh, is pretty much the, the mirror side of uh, precipitation because they share the same thermodynamic uh, uh, formulas and the same uh, kinetic uh, environment. And this was pointed out by Dan Sinclair for our spilotem environment back in 2011. And uh, uh, another paper in 2012, where he synthesized the, let's say, the modeling uh, for magnesium and strontium partitioning in uh, drip water and in, uh, in spilotems as well. And uh, they found that the uh, mechanism of uh, incongruent carbonate dissolution and prior calcite precipitation gave uh, produce a, a, a similar uh, straight line correlation if plotted the strontium calcium against the magnesium calcium on a log scale. And this uh, straight correlation is the test uh, for having a PCP or ICT in our a trace element or drip water data. But uh, this method do not allow us to distinguish between the two processes. So we need another element to distinguish between them. And uh, one very simple test that we can do is using uh, spring water because spring water uh, is usually undersaturated. So no prior calcium precipitation occurs in the aquifer. And this is what we did for our caves in Trentino by comparing the drip water from the cave with spring water from the same area in the same horse truck. And we can see that uh, by using the magnesium calcium ratio versus the discharge, they are uh, most or some of the data set are negatively correlated. But when we look, uh, so, in this case, we know that this is due to in incongruent carbonate dissolution, but we can tell for sure what happened here because we can have also prior calcium precipitation. But if we look also at, at the calcium content of the water, we can see that uh, uh, if we have just incongruent carbonate dissolution, we just have a negative correlation between uh, calcium and the discharge, whereas if we have prior calcium precipitation, the series will be positive correlated between the two variables. So this is a very uh, simple test that we can do with our drip water data in order to distinguish between the two processes. And this is why we need really need some uh, uh, water hydrochemistry from our caves in order to interpret our uh, trace element time series. And we can see here how this 
concepts uh, were applied uh, from these two studies, one in Hollow Ridge Cave in Florida and the other in our uh, cave in Trentino. So we can see that depending by the composition of the host rock from almost pure limestone to uh, dolomite, we can have a different starting point in the uh, drip water composition. And then if we have prior cancer precipitation, the drip water will be aligned along a straight line, which is the prior cancer precipitation vector. And this is uh, applied not just for strontium and magnesium, but for most of the element uh, which has a which have a lower than one partition coefficient, like for example, silica and sulfur as we uh, did here. And by knowing the point, the starting point of the uh, prior cancer precipitation, we can calculate exactly the amount of PCP occurred in, in our aquifer. And by using different elements, we can uh, double check and cross check the number we, we will get. So this is a very useful tool to apply. On the other end, we can see that some uh, drip water data are not aligned along this line. So this is a test that no or not significant amount of prior cancer precipitation is taking place. So uh, partitioning uh, is, is uh, I would say extremely important for magnesium and strontium, which are the two elements which are mostly utilized in our uh, trace element reconstruction. And uh, from, from the beginning, uh, back in, in 2000, it was, uh, uh, let's say, demonstrated that also in, in our cave settings, magnesium uh, is depend uh, by the temperature. So the partitioning of magnesium increases as the temperature increases. And this was confirmed also by laboratory study that they and Anderson, but also by a more extensive data set. Although, as you can see here, there's quite a, a, a spread of data, especially at higher temperature. And this is not uh, still uh, completely understood. So it's not just temperature, there are other processes involved in the partitioning of magnesium. And this is something that we will have to investigate in the next few years. For strontium, the situation is even more complicated. So in the marine environment where most of the experiment occurred, uh, there's a clear correlation between the precipitation rate and the strontium partitioning. And this was also pointed out uh, from the first study by Wang Fertzel in 2001 uh, by using a cave analog experiment. And this was also what we observed in the Spilotem time series. So from this study, for example, in Grotta del Nesto stalagmite, we have a, a nice correlation between the strontium content and the annual growth rate. Of course, strontium content is not the partition coefficient, but uh, uh, this uh, uh, correlation between strontium and growth rate is something that is diagnostic of uh, a possible influence of uh, uh, growth rate on strontium incorporation. And we also test in a two coheval stalagmite from Grotta Savi. And here, although the, the slope of the uh, correlation are different, still they are statistically significant, as we can see here in the time series spanning throughout the, the younger dryas. However, laboratory experiment by Day Anderson 2013, they found no uh, correlation between uh, partition of strontium and growth rate, although the experiment were made up at very different temperatures. So there's no clear laboratory test uh, about uh, strontium uh, partitioning and, and growth rate. And also some compilation by Basso and Burgetal uh, last year by using also uh, caves in dolomite, uh, which has a very high partitioning in strontium, uh, 
they do not find any clear relationship between the two variables. So there's still no consensus about the uh, control of growth rate on strontium incorporation. On the other end, it's more, I would say, uh, is more clear that strontium incorporation is affected by the uh, presence of other ion in solution and also by the same strontium calcium in the water. So the more strontium calcium or a sodium strontium, as uh, uh, Russell Dreisdell pointed out uh, from this uh, data set, so from both uh, the uh, laboratory test and the uh, Hollow Ridge Cave uh, study from Tremaine and Froehlig, and the phreatic deposit in Corkia, there's a quite clear uh, negative exponential correlation between the partition of strontium and the sodium to uh, strontium ratio. And uh, the same apply for strontium and strontium calcium in the water, but also between the partition of strontium and magnesium calcium in the calcite meaning that uh, probably the, uh, the substrate, uh, the growing substrate is influenced by magnesium. So the more magnesium we have, the more distortion in the lattice of the, the growing calcite. And this uh, creates uh, uh, defects and possibly kink and step site, which are the preferential site for the incorporation of strontium. So, uh, to summarize this part, we can see that uh, although for magnesium there's a consensus about the temperature dependence, still there, there are unknown other variables that are influencing the partitioning. And for strontium, the situation is much more complicated because we have uh, a lot of uh, uh, different uh, uh, variables uh, competing with their, each other. But uh, what we observe is that uh, strontium and sodium, for example, are uh, uh, in competition for the same uh, step and kick site and defects. So the more uh, of this element we have in the solution, the lower will be the partition for both strontium and sodium. So they are both uh, compete and both also positioning uh, themselves. We can now have a look at what happened in, in the calcite fabric. All these uh, examples are from calcite spilt, and I do not include any aragonite uh, uh, minerals in order not to complicate too much the situation. And uh, from the same uh, high resolution mapping study by Pauline Treble back in 2005, it was already clear that the incorporation in the calcite uh, is not homogeneous. And although some of the salt elements like barium, strontium, uranium, and sodium follow the annual growth layer, still the distribution is very irregular. And other elements like phosphorus and magnesium, they have a very, uh, let's say, fuzzy and very complicated distribution in the calcite structure. So this is the first time we observe this kind of uh, uh, inhomogeneity uh, in, uh, in our calcite fabric. And as high resolution techniques like synchrotron radiation XRF were made available, we observe at a finer scale what happened in the calcite fabric. And in this study, we did uh, from calcite coralloid uh, that has a very low growth rate, less than one micron per year. And they grow for uh, aerosol and evaporation uh, and capillary flow at the top. So in the axial part of the coralloid, we, we have much more enhanced evaporation. And so we have a concentration of the non-calcium elements. So all the other elements, strontium, barium, yttrium, uranium, and so on, are preferentially incorporated in the apical part of the coralloid. But what happened is that depending by the fabric of the coralloid, uh, 
the incorporation changes. So if we have a columnar elongated fabric, the distribution is more homogeneous. But when where we have fiber-like fabric uh, creates a lens shape, a lens shape uh, horizon, where most of this element will be preferentially concentrated. And we can also see that uh, along this layer, still we have uh, a heterogeneous distribution. So strontium uh, follows this fan-like distribution and uh, some of the uh, less soluble elements like iron and silica are eventually incorporated in between this fan-like structure. So at, at this finer scale, we, we can see how complicated the incorporation can be. And of course, in, in porous uh, spilotems, we can have, as we have already seen, the porosity, but also uh, grain inclusion. And somehow grain and impurity are the reason of the porous fabric and not vice versa. And so in porous band, we have, uh, uh, let's say a concentration of a grain inclusion that can be few micron or few tens of micron in diameter. So we really need this high resolution mapping technique. But also there can be a very fine particle. So around a couple of micron in almost continuous layers like we have here for iron. But this is a kind of, of I would say, of a unique situation. The most common situation is like here for strontium, this uh, uh, more coarse, uh, let's say, coarse inclusion in correspondence to the, the, the high uh, porosity layer. And this can uh, explain, I would say, somehow uh, the scattering of the data in the uh, trace element partitioning. So we can uh, we can say that if we analyze our uh, calcite from a different part of the spilotem, we will have a very different concentration that we will end up with a very different partition coefficient. So this is something that we will have to investigate in the future to couple the, uh, let's say, the partition experiment with a proper uh, fabric cross-check. And this happens not just for porous uh, stalagmite, which is kind of a very common situation, but also for columnar uh, calcite stalagmite. Although this is not always the case. So in several stalagmite we analyze, we do not observe this uh, kind of heterogeneity. But this study with uh, uh, laser ablation raster scanning make by Slivisk and installed this year on Asturias stalagmite in Spain, they documented a kind of heterogeneous distribution similar to what we already uh, seen in our calcite coralloid. So in the apical part, in the spire part, as they called of the uh, calcite crystal, we have a higher concentration in strontium, magnesium, and sodium, and so on. Whereas in the depressed, in the intracrystalline part of the, of the, of the fabric, we have a lower concentration. And so we have this uh, sectoral zoning that can be quite severe, especially for magnesium and, and sodium and nickel as well. On the other end, uh, strontium and, uh, and zinc and copper are less affected. So they listed here the best seasonal signal coming from strontium, zinc, copper, aluminum, and yttrium, whereas magnesium, nickel, and sodium are strongly affected by this sectoral zoning. And again, this can be, as I said before, one of the reasons of this, this scattering of the data in our uh, 
partition coefficient. So it's something that we have to be aware of when calculating this uh, partitioning. And uh, I would say the worst case scenario are uh, micritic band and stromatolite like layer within the stalagmite, which are not very common, but uh, uh, they are documented in several stalagmites, especially when we have condensed growth and uh, hiatuses. And in this uh, uh, XLF uh, synchrotron mapping from a uh, 4 million year stalagmite in, in the Nullarbor, Australia, uh, we saw how uh, the uh, detrital element and the colloidal attached particle are much more concentrated in this band. So for silica, for example, we have a, a quite large grain inclusion, but also a much more fine uh, inclusion in this, uh, in this uh, stromatolite like layer and are trapped by the organic matter that just uh, keep them uh, in, uh, in, the, in the calcite structure. And the same apply for phosphorus, but also from, for manganese, iron, aluminum, and so on. On the other end, the soluble element, like barium, strontium, magnesium, are not affected. So although, uh, the, of course, the distribution is, uh, is not homogeneous, but there's no enrichment or not much change in the uh, partitioning for magnesium and the other uh, solute element. And uh, also strontium is less concentrated in this stromatolite like layer. And this suggests that strontium as a, uh, let's say, uh, really hates organic matter. So whenever we have a high organic matter content, we have a lower strength incorporation. And sulfur, like magnesium, has uh, this zonal uh, distribution, pretty much as we have seen in, uh, in the Asturias uh, uh, stalagmite and uh, in our calcite coralloid. So uh, now I will introduce the, the more, let's say, interesting thing for our purposes, some example of uh, climate and environment are significant, starting with the, uh, the prior cancer precipitation paradigm, which was uh, until a few years ago, I would say, the most uh, common uh, uh, mechanism that was, uh, let's say, uh, was used in order to explain the, uh, the correlation uh, between magnesium and strontium in spilletium time series. And these two seminal studies from uh, uh, southern Brazil by Cruz et al. and uh, Flores Indonesia by Griffith et al. are pretty much uh, uh, demonstrated the same, the same thing. So we have cycles in, sorry, cycles in the oxygen isotopes which are nicely correlated with the uh, uh, summer insulation in the southern hemisphere. And so they tell us that uh, higher insulation is related to higher precipitation in the area and vice versa. So the same uh, cycles are replicated in the trace element, both strontium and magnesium as a similar behavior and so we can see that the higher, uh, during the dry episodes, we have higher magnesium and higher strontium content and vice versa. And the same was documented in, in Flores, Indonesia, where uh, pretty much the same situation. So the, let's say the, uh, the precipitation is controlled by the Australian Indonesian summer monsoon, which is, uh, in turn uh, controlled by the summer insulation. And the magnesium calcium and strontium calcium ratio, they do follow this, uh, this pattern, this trend. Although in some places they split apart. And this is something that uh, uh, can give us uh, uh, another layer of uh, interpretation if we want to dig deeper in this, uh, in this data. 
But this is not always the case. So there are, uh, on the other end, several examples in which uh, magnesium is anti-correlated with respect to strontium and barium, because uh, strontium and barium in all the study published so far, they always correlate with uh, each other. On the other end, magnesium can be correlated or anti-correlated, as in this study from Nettlebade in, uh, in New Zealand, uh, where when we pass from the last glacial maximum through the Holocene, we have uh, an increase of the, the precipitation temperature and forex extent as determined by the carbon isotope, a negative shift and the increase in the luminescence. And this uh, shift is coupled with an increase in strontium and barium and a decreasing magnesium. And this was explained by incongruent carbon and dissolution because of the dolomite uh, host rock uh, uh, where the cave developed. So the, the longer uh, the, the residence time of the water in the aquifer during low uh, precipitation, low infiltration, the more magnesium we have from the dolomite, but also the less strontium and barium because strontium and barium are less concentrated in the dolomite phase. And when we move towards a more limestone uh, contribution, magnesium will lower and volume and strontium will rise. So uh, on the other end, when we move from the, let's say, centennial or millennial time scale to the annual time scale, things get much more, even more complicated because of the possible uh, delay of transmission of the signal from the surface to, to the cave itself. And there, there are uh, several studies about the, the trace element annual cycles in, in stalagmite, but also we can detect in, in soda straw as well, and in flowstone if the growth rate is uh, is fast enough. And what was observed in many studies uh, is the predominance or the prevalence of the prior carcer precipitation or incongruent carbon and dissolution, if we like, in most of the, the, the stalagmite. So from China, Johnston et al., from uh, Gibraltar, Dave Marte et al., and our study in the Cook Island, we have magnesium, strontium, barium, and sodium, which are correlated, and the cycle are more enriched during the dry season where we have enhanced prior cancer precipitation. On the other end, we have uranium, yttrium, but also phosphorus and uh, all the uh, transition metal which are more concentrated during the uh, fast infiltration events. So they are, uh, let's say, suggesting the, the wet season. So this is one of the, the common situation, especially when we are in a, let's say, in a, uh, in a continental setting, so away from the sea. And we can see that also, uh, depending by the climate setting, the cycle can be uh, very clear. For example, if we are in a monsoon setting or in a Mediterranean setting, like uh, also in Southwest Australia, whereas in uh, tropical settings, like here in the South Pacific, the cycles are present, but are not so clear. So this is the reason why for this uh, uh, stalagmite in the tropic, we need a much more sophisticated data treatment in order to detect the, the annual cycles in uh, stalagmite. However, as I said, this is not always the case, this uh, trace element distribution, because uh, depending by the distance from the sea, so from, for the sourcing of the element and the host rock composition, we can have a much more complicated situation as a, a Pauline Trebo detected in Southwest Australia, but also here in, in China, we have magnesium, which is anti-correlated with respect to strontium and barium, because uh, 
most of the money, magnesium is not coming from the host rock, but from the, uh, the solution in the soil of a non-carbonate component. And this is possibly also what happened in, uh, in Southwest Australia, where part of magnesium is sourced from, from sea spray, but also we have a contribution from non-carbonate particle in the host rock as well for the other element. So we really need to know our bedrock composition and diagenesis in order to have a clear, let's say, background of what is going on in our spilatem. And finally, uh, there were lately some attempt to pass from the, let's say, qualitative or uh, reconstruction of the hydrology by using this uh, PCP or incongruent dissolution concept to a quantitative uh, reconstruction. And there is this very nice attempt by Sophie Worken in 2018 from Klozani Cave in Romania, uh, where they utilized magnesium calcium to uh, reconstruct the, uh, the, the, the precipitation, especially the autumn winter precipitation in a Holocene stalagmite. Here, interesting, they use the, the strontium and barium calcium, which again are very nicely correlated, and they have a very nice annual cycles to establish the lamina counting and to establish the precise calendar age model. On the other end, again, magnesium has a much more uh, irregular annual cycles, but because it's mostly influenced by the the prior calcium precipitation has a much more robust paleohydrological uh, significance. On the other end, in this study, they attributed strontium and barium growth to changes in growth rate. So again, is the partitioning of strontium and barium influenced by the growth rate with minima in summer when we have uh, the, uh, the higher infiltration and lower supersaturation. And interesting, uh, they had to detrend the magnesium calcium series in order to have a more uh, robust correlation with the infiltration. And this uh, uh, trend, this uh, shift in the trace element series is what happened time and again in several uh, trace element time series data. And so this is something we will have to uh, investigate and be aware of. Then we can go to another element, which is multi-sourced, is uh, sulfur, which can come from different uh, places, I would say. So we already seen the problem of biogeochemical cycling of sulfur. Uh, by the vegetation and in the soil zone and the possible sources of strontium. So in this case, from Grotta d'Ernesto, we have a source from the, the bedrock, which uh, gave this baseline sulfur contained very low, around 15 parts per million. And then we have uh, spikes, uh, short-term spikes related to the volcanic eruption and then the steady uh, rise during the, the Industrial Revolution and the final acceleration during the last 30 years related to the emission, sulfur emission in the atmosphere in Central Europe. And we have seen that we have a delay of the peak of the emission with respect to the record in our spilotent data of about uh, 20 years is a variable uh, uh, leg uh, depending by the efficiency of the biogeochemical cycle in this in the soil and vegetation. And a similar delay was also documented in this uh, Santorini eruption from Sofular Cave in Turkey, where the uh, eruption was, uh, let's say, detected by short lived peaks in bromine and molybdenum, and then with a delay of about 20 years, we finally had the peak in, uh, in sulfur as well, due to the, the biochemical cycling in the soil zone. 
And uh, finally, we can have multi-element interpretation. When we finally use uh, different uh, kind of elements, so the solute element, magnesium, barium, strontium, the colloidal related zinc and yttrium, and the detrital, so silicon and aluminum, as in this case. And we can see in this reconstruction from a flowstone from Tanake Urla in central Italy by Regatieri et al. that uh, uh, the salt element follow the uh, prior calcium precipitation or incongruent car carbon dissolution paradigm. So they do follow the, uh, the stable isotope, the oxygen, and also carbon isotope as well. Although in some uh, phases like this, uh, dry phases documented in the oxygen and carbon isotope, they uh, do not agree uh, that much. So there's, there's a split in this case. Whereas the uh, detrital the element, they uh, just uh, uh, follows this uh, climatic deterioration, so a soil deterioration with the input of this uh, detrital stuff. So we can combine our trace element data in order to have a more comprehensive uh, understand and uh, interpretation of the uh, trace element data. And this is what we did. Uh, this uh, recent paper from uh, Bigonda Cave in Italian Priad by Johnston and, and, uh, and, and us in uh, a very deep cave, more than a thousand uh, meter deep aquifer. And we are still in the last interglacier. And uh, in here, we have a very complex situation because we have the infiltration from the, the high plateau up there, but also from the valley flank. So at the start of the deglaciation, we, we had still the glacier at the top of the plateau. And the melt water from the glacier just gave a very negative oxygen isotope composition to the drip water. And also the presence of uh, uh, Eolian uh, dust uh, on the plateau, very rich in strontium, gave a very uh, rich strontium content to the flowstone. And it was uh, pretty much five times higher than the baseline level that was reached finally after a few thousand years, during which most of the loess on the plateau was completely weathered. At the same time, the uh, reforestation of the area, because during there was no, <laughs> no vegetation at all during the last during the, the glacial period, took several times to be established, like we, we can see in the carbon isotope. And interesting, in the first reforestation phase, we, we had a negative shift in phosphorus because all the phosphorus was sequestered by the growing vegetation. Only when the, the forest was established, we had a rise in the fossil content in the flowstone as well. So again, this uh, uh, multi-element interpretation also coupled with the, the petrography. So we can see that the detrital element here uh, that testified this uh, uh, very fast infiltration and disequilibrium phase is also recorded in the disequilibrium fabric in the flowstone. So in order to conclude, we have seen that we have complex uh, dissolution kinetic as a function of the bedrock composition and the rock water interaction. So we really need to know our bedrock and possibly involve a geologist where things are complicated. And also, the complex partitioning that we have that can be unraveled by studying the drip water uh, composition. So the cave monitoring or at least some basic cave monitoring is needed. And then we have seen the, the sectoral zoning and the fabric that can influence the trace element incorporation. So again, petrography and possibly high resolution mapping is required when we would like to have an accurate calibration of our trace element data and a proper interpretation of longer time series. And I think that we already uh, 
discuss this point. So I will stop here and uh, I'm just uh, open to possible questions. Um, thanks, Andrea. That's, that's a lovely talk. Um, yeah, so just these little, little metal rich particles, I, for strontium, it puzzles me where they're coming from because you normally see them with the elements that are coming from the soil and it makes sense because they're, you know, transported as colloids or, or something similar. So, but the strontium is usually coming from bedrock is that a is that a puzzle to you or what's what's your explanation for that you mean the, the grain inclusion of strontium yeah yeah so in this case is uh, this this uh from the cook island where we have still this uh, this very young bedrock with still some aragonite relict in it so i think that uh, at least the, the largest largest grain inclusion are coming uh, not uh, as a solve, but just uh, detaching from, from the roof of the cave itself. So are just, uh, let's say, dust uh, that are produced inside the cave, not uh, coming from the drip water, because they are too large to be uh, transported throughout the, the, the aquifer. Whereas on the other end, the smaller size particle, uh, they can come uh, from the, 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 the fluid, so, but still I think they are detached, uh, let's say, in, in, the last, uh, <laughs> in the last section of, uh, of the aquifer in order to be not in solution, but still as a small grain. And the last possibility is uh, a strong evaporation uh, along the, the, the lamina, but this, this was not the case for, for this, uh, is uh, stalagmite, but in other cases we can have, uh, if we have uh, 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 a, a stop growing of the stalagmite, we can have uh, enhanced evaporation. So for the coralloid, for example, this can be the case, but still in the coralloid, we did not uh, map any uh, grain inclusion, just this very fine, uh, fine fan-like structure so all this stuff was in solution and was incorporated uh, in, in the fabric as uh, ion, not, uh, not particles. All right, thanks. Yeah, so most likely literally little pieces of bedrock. Yes, yes. But, and I, I would say you wouldn't normally, it's not that common in the strontium maps, is it? It is not that common, you are right. So usually strontium, Barium is, is most, uh, I, I see from, let's say, from also laser ablation data, you have much more peaks in, in, in uh, grain in barium than in strontium. Strontium is, is very unlikely, uh, like magnesium, are not very common, this, this grain inclusion. But uh, in some uh, cer certain circumstances, you can have. So this is the reason why uh, as I said, the, the study of the bedrock is uh, extremely important, especially when we are dealing with young bedrock. So like uh, your Eolianite or our uh, Makatea of Pleistocene in, in the South Pacific is, uh, is very complex and complicated. And what we observe, if you move from one drip to the other, the drip water composition and the stalagmite trace element CS can change quite quite dramatically. Whereas in, in a very old bedrock cave, usually you can replicate the, the, the trace element time series from one stalagmite to the other uh, without a, a big problem. So the younger the bedrock, the more complicated the, 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 the situation is, especially in, in su superficial caves because of course if you move in a very deep aquifer all the let's say the, the the drip water chemistry is average so you lose completely the annual cycles and you end up with a very average signature but in superficial caves is always there okay thanks andrea hi andrea thanks for the talk 
Um, I was just wondering if there's other ways to distinguish between PCP and uh, um, incongruent dis dissolution aside from the spring water test and how important is that for long interpreting long time series over like glacial interglacial periods? Yes, of course, if you are dealing with, if you do not have drip water data, which I think uh, they, they should be a prerequisite, a must for any paleoclimate reconstruction. So they do not need, you do not need to have a, a long, uh, year long uh, uh, monitoring program, but just a few analysis during the, the wet and the dry period can give you a, a very, let's say, baseline interpretation for the, the, the trace element data. But if you don't have them, you have to rely on the trace element themselves. And there are cross tests that you can use. So usually, as I said, it's very common that the elements that are, let's say, affected by prior carcer precipitation and incongruent carbon in the solution, in time, they drift. So instead of following, yeah. let's say, a baseline, you have one element, let's say magnesium, which is drifting away, but strontium and bario uh, do not. So you can use this multiple uh, element, which can be potentially affected by PCP or incongruent carbon in the solution to test this, this stuff. So if you just have uh, prior carcer precipitation, all the salt element should drift and should follow the same trend. If one of them just split away, you know that you have incongruent carbon in the solution. And this is very uh, common when you have, uh, as I said, a shallow aquifer in which any changes in, in the feeding structure, so in the fracture zone, but uh, can change the residence time of, of the water. So just also in the Holocene, we seen that some minimum adjustment in the fracture in the aquifer changes in, in, the, in the very short period, the, 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 the trace element in the drip water and in the spillotem. So in our uh, Cook Island spillotem, which are very shallow case, few, few meters, and as I said, very young bedrock. So we have a very heterogeneous bedrock and very shallow aquifer all the, the series are somehow drifting away. So <laughs> there's no agreement. And if you plot two, two coheval series from the same chamber in the cave, they just uh, split away. So you know that there you have incongruent carbon in dissolution, which is, uh, of course, you can have both. So this is, yeah. uh, unfortunately, <laughs> it is not that you have just one or the other, the common situation is that you have both of them. But for interpreting our data, it's not a problem because they are both controlled by the, uh, let's say, infiltration. So the residence time, the longer the residence time, the longer is the incongruent, or let's say, the lower incongruent dissolution you have, but the higher prior cancer precipitation you have. And they both move along the same line. So they are yeah. both concentrated by uh, dry periods. So in terms of, I would say, uh, qualitative interpretation is not a big deal. But when you are looking for quantitative data, you have to model all of them in order to distinguish between these two uh, factors. Great, thanks so much for clarifying, yeah. <laughs> yeah I can ask one more if you've got time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Andrea, I'm just thinking about reconstructing uh, rainfall from magnesium time series in speleotherms. And um, you know, I've always worked in water limited environments, and the, the signal is always highly non linear, that PCP signal. Um, and so you've worked in a, a greater range of environments. Do you, do you think it's ever linear with changes in rainfall? Oh, I don't think so. So from my experience, most of the, the uh, magnesium series, they do have trends. But uh, 
Of course, this is more complicated when you are in a coastal setting. So both in your southwestern Australian Cape and in our Cook Island, spirit, we are a few hundreds of meters or a few kilometers away from the sea. So any changes in the, the wind strength and wind direction can affect the magnesium content in the stalagmite. So some of the drift we are seeing can be explained by, uh, let's say, aquifer uh, adjustment, but some other are likely related to just uh, changes in the wind circulation. So it's, it's more complicated in this way. And for this reason, for example, the, uh, the stalagmite that uh, Mohammed studied and we published this year, you have drift in magnesium, but not in strontium and barium. And strontium and barium are coming mostly from, let's say, soil and bedrock and magnesium from, from the sea spray. So you know that in this case, uh, the, the problem is magnesium is related somehow to the atmospheric circulation. And so, as I said, although strontium and barium are more complicated in both the, the sourcing and, uh, and the partitioning, they give, a, let's say, a baseline uh, confidence level, which is more reliable, I would say, with respect to magnesium. So magnesium is more sensitive to dry period, but still is more complicated by both the sourcing and possible this uh, adjustment in the in the in the aquifer that can change both the the let's say the, the provenance of magnesium but also the incongruent dissolution so strontium and barium are not as much as affected by incongruent carbonate dissolution as it is magnesium because uh, magnesium if we have uh, high magnesium calcite around or dolomite is very, let's say, is very hard to dissolve. So you need a much more longer time to dissolve it. So it's more, magnesium is more sensitive to incongruent carbonate dissolution. Whereas strontium and barium are more sensitive to prior calcium precipitation. So again, if you use the three of them together, and you can use sodium as well, because in coastal setting, Sodium is a very nice paleohydrological indicator. You can have a quite a complete picture of, of what is going on. But of course, you have to, to model all these trace elements because they interact together. And as we have seen, they just compete with, with each other, especially strontium and sodium, for the incorporation. So, it is, it's, it's a very complex model. And Eta Stoll did the, this uh, ISTOL uh, program, but uh, uh, there are others that are working on, on the same approach. So by changing not just the, uh, the let's say, the, the amount of PCP, but also changing the same uh, partitioning by using different drip water chemistry. So, is a kind of uh, more complex approach, but uh, in coastal setting is what, what we need because uh, in coastal setting, as I said, the sodium content in the drip water is so high and it poison for sure the, 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 the size for strontium incorporation. So this is another layer of complexity that we have to deal with. Yes, yeah, so, yeah, so all of the complications of the other sources aside, like even if you know it's um, a PCP signal, I think you have to be able to model it to relate it back to rainfall because it's always so highly nonlinear. And I, I just suspect that's everywhere and not just in water limited environments. Yeah, yes, especially, I would say, especially in, in superficial caves, because uh, if you go uh, down a deep aquifer, as I said, you have an average of the signal. But what happened in superficial cave is that the, the, the precipitation is not occurring throughout the year or the, the growth of, of the spill attempts is, is very heterogeneous and in changes uh, season by season. Whereas in deep cave is more 
easy. So you have maybe you have a, a more uh, fast growth, let's say, in winter because of the, the higher the guessing, but it's not so complex and complicated as it is in superficial case, where the, the, the water resistance time can change, uh, uh, let's say, year by year, whereas in deep cave, maybe the residence time is, is let's say, uh, two or three year, and this average pretty much the, the, the signature of the drip water. But in superficial cave, as uh, in Grotta del Nesto, it is another case in which uh, we have year by year, the, the, the water residence time is changing seasonally. And so the growth of the calcite changes every month. And it is, it's very difficult to, to, to measure and to model properly. And so you have really to, to use all the possible <laughs> uh, the tips and tricks in order to, to, to unravel the situation. Yeah, okay, thanks. It, it's, yeah, that's a good point about cave depth and too. Thanks, Andrea. I just wanted to um, um, tell something about, uh, you, showed, you showed a plot of mine with yes. um, strontium distribution coefficient against strontium calcium ratio in the water. Sure. Um, sure. I know that uh, there are there is this uh, study from Tesoriero uh, Panko, I mm -hmm. think that's the one. They show, they show a clear correspondence between um, distribution coefficient for strontium and strontium calcium ratios. Um, but in my, in my paper, I actually think that it is, uh, that this relation is related to the um, um, dolomite and limestone uh, balance. Yes. So uh, what you also, what you also see is that if you, if I plotted that data, um, the water strontium calcium ratio against magnesium calcium, then you see exactly the same trend, but then, um, yeah, as you see in the strontium against strontium calcium of the water. So I think in, in that case, it is more related that dolomite has, uh, tends to have a lower strontium calcium ratio. Sure. As compared to the magnesium calcium ratio. And I think that that, uh, that explains this a relation between uh, that you showed in your presentation. But like I say, I mean, there is also evidence that strontium distribution coefficients and strontium calcium in the water are uh, related as well. But in my plot, I think it's um, more related to the dolomite and limestone. Yes, and this is the reason why I, I just put this who controls who, because uh, there are several, uh, let's say, inter- yeah. Uh, interacting uh, agent and, uh, and mechanism. So it's really difficult to disentangle. And on the top of this, we have the, the fabric, uh, let's say, uh, uh, incorporation and fractionation. So we really do not know if the fabric uh, incorporation is controlling the incorporation or vice versa. Or if the, yeah. let's say, the partition coefficient yep. that somehow force the, the, the fabric, but it is very difficult to test because we do not have, uh, or so far, the possibility of uh, making laboratory experiment in which we precipitate a uh, cassette with different fabric, with different yep. fluid composition. So it is, it's, really, it's really difficult to test, but I think that this will be the next level, the next step in our, uh, let's say, uh, partition coefficient stories. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now this is what is uh, because what I also uh, still miss in the literature is uh, like experiments, uh, lab controlled experiments with where they, uh, where they were with uh, strontium calcium ratios, magnesium calcium ratios. Uh, that are like uh, uh, known for levels for, known for speleothemes, and then just uh, start with uh, keep strontium calcium constant. Yeah, yeah. And then, like, so slowly reduce the magnesium calcium ratio yeah. and see what happens with partitioning yeah. coefficient. Yeah, yeah. You know that is that is stuff that I'm that's still missing. And that's, yeah, that yeah. should be done. Yeah. yeah. But as I say, strontium as 
so many different ingredients uh, acting yeah. at the same time that is is quite difficult to disentangle them all. And on top yeah. of this, we have this growth rate <laughs> ingredient yeah. that uh, complicate the story because uh, what we are dealing with is not uh, we just measure the, the let's say the, the the vertical extension rate, but the the, uh, uh, the really growth rate yeah. is what happened. Agree at the, let's say, at the second scale. So it's not the, the, the growth rate we measure. So are yeah. two different uh, 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 variables that are uh, different to compare and uh, impossible to measure, I would say. So it's something that uh, we will have to, to investigate in more detail. Yeah, yeah, I agree with it. You showed a plot with uh, uh, from uh, Serena Badercher. Yeah, uh, with uh, with the bromine. Yeah, uh, showing a volcanic signal. Yes. Um, do you, would you expect that? Um, because this, I think, from from my uh, from my head, I think I only know one paper that's using the bromine um, in the in the speed of heaps, and I think that's that's the Badetsche paper, right? Yes, yes. Or are there more, or or are there other ones as well? Because I, I think it would be really good to test it on uh, yes, different yes, uh, volcanic yes. eruptions. Sure, sure. This this volcanic eruption story is still uh, un, under development, I would say, because uh, yeah. we have now some fine example that are let's say in which we have also let's say. Uh, uh, volcanic ash uh, within the spilotems in, in New Zealand, for example, is quite common. Oh, cool. But this is is a very peculiar situation, which where you are very near the volcanic eruption source. Uh, when you have a soil in a thick aquifer, we just see a, a very muted signal or or flattened signal or no signal at all, and. Yeah. Uh, this is the reason why uh, is is not uh, still is not used as a routine analysis. So we are not able to detect, like in ice cores, uh, every each uh, volcanic eruption taking place uh, throughout the globe. So we are able to see if we are near the volcanic eruption, a downstream downwind of the, the volcanic plume. Mm -hmm. And uh, with a thin soil, uh, let's say filtering action that allow to the, the element to be transmitted. And uh, what we have seen, we are seeing now is that you have, uh, uh, let's say, indirect evidence of the, the volcanic eruption in spilotems, like, uh, let's say, uh, aquifer readjustment. So no, no, no any element related to the, the eruption but something mm -hmm. that occur in the aquifer instead. But this is, is not easy to demonstrate because can can be anything no. else. So uh, it, I think this is the reason why it is not widely applied because it's still difficult to find a case that are sensitive. So ideally with no soil cover or with very thin soil cover and in sensitive area with respect to the, the main eruption. We are working on this. <laughs> yeah. So, but but uh, do you think that bromine would have the highest potential for it? Ah, uh, but you have to to have really a downwind of, of the volcanic eruption in the plume, right? To be able to, yeah. to, to detect it, because bromine is very volatile and uh, is is yeah. easily fastly transmitted but uh, is, is also filtered uh, by, by, by the soil somehow. So you have to have really a lot of bromine in the eruption and to be near the eruption center in order to... to... Right, yeah, true. Okay. Just a more general question maybe for closing the seminar series or this mini seminar series that you gave. Um, if you could wrap everything up, like you kind of touched on it in your conclusions already, but if you could give us maybe the best practices for um, speed of them trace element records, um, what would be like the, 
the things that we really need to look out for since it's such a complex uh, topic and uh, it's yeah it seems like people have different opinions sometimes also sure sure so i would say that uh, you cannot uh, uh, let's say tackle all the different aspects but uh, i think that a basic basic hydrochemistry study is 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 uh, the basic requirement so you cannot interpret spirit and series also if they are fossil without having a knowledge of the aquifer itself so it doesn't take much to have uh, let's say a few analyses you're going to need a, a years long monitoring study to to understand what happened in uh, in the aquifer and in some cases you just need a few let's say analysis in the wet and in the dry season to understand what what's going on in the aquifer the other thing is the bedrock uh, most of the study do not take into account the bedrock at all just uh, say well is a uh, limestone with some dolomite content and that's it but you have to measure you have to to look at the diagenesis and at the composition of your bedrock because this is where most of the solute element are sourced and come from and finally in the cave and in this in our spill attempts you have to do a test of the let's say the quality of the reliability re reproducibility of your data by using if you use laser ablation you have to use multiple parallel line scan to test the presence of peak but also some drift and trend that you can have and uh, let's say ideally uh, do some small map test in key area to investigate the possible uh, sectoral zoning or the influence of different fabric in uh, in in the spill attempt and the distribution of trace element in some cases uh, we know that if you you want to do a proper uh, petrographic log you need uh, a continuous thing section so it's a very tedious uh, work and you destroy <laughs> a lot of stalagmite but you can do test thing section in key areas in when you have uh, let's say hiatuses or uh, changes in the the trace element composition so also in this case you do not have to make a, a let's say a continuous record a continuous petrographic log but still few thing section analysis can be diagnostic of what is, uh, is happening in your spill attempt and of course if you are able to do high resolution mapping this is really the, the best uh, let's say the best approach you can have and this will give a, a heaps of additional information about uh, your your record yep great yeah that's that's really good um yeah i think we have lots to think about so thank you again very much andrea um thank you all for coming and i Hope you have a nice day or evening or whatever it is where you are. Bye-bye. <laughs>